Hello. How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. Uh, just uh, got Twitter reinstalled on my phone, uh, specifically to do this space. So I'm excited to be here. It, uh, it takes a good space to uh, to get me to reinstall Twitter on my phone. So there you go. Wow. Well, we are so honored. Thank you. Uh, that's amazing. Um, how long have you been off of it? Oh, uh, I haven't had it on my phone in at least a year. Um, it's just, you know, these things are addicting. Uh, and uh, Twitter just gets blown up constantly. So not something good to have in your pocket all day long, in my opinion. But uh, it is good for stuff like this. So I just reinstall it every time I actually, uh, you know, need to do something like this. So it works well for me. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it does save you from being chronically online, I would I would imagine, which is great. Um, I can't say as much for myself. Hi, Alex and Def Beef. It's so good to see you here. Thank you for coming today. Hey, hey, really happy to be here. Likewise. All right, we have quite a full room already. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, how's everyone doing today? Where are we calling in from? I'm I'm from uh, Toronto, Canada. I'm in uh, Austin, Texas. I'm in London, England. And I am in Brooklyn, New York. We are spanning a little bit of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> oh, amazing. Um, well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pin some of the artwork to the top of the space. And then we can get started here in just a minute, if that sounds good. Lovely. Oh, and everyone in the audience, hi. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, if you want to tweet about the space and tell your friends about it, uh, the more the merrier. So uh, I know there are some tweets going out right now and some, some, some different notifications. So please um, feel free to share. And I do see some other artists from the retrospective here. I see Lee. It's so good to see you again. Um, Lee was with us yesterday for a talk about bodies. Um, also see some friends, see Art World, Dan. Hello, everyone. Quite the crowd already. This is wonderful. Alex, is it uh, still raining in London? Uh, last time I was there for seven days, it rained every single day, multiple times per day. Don't stereotype London, Tyler. This is, we, we, got, <laughs> we, have, we have blue skies right now, and they are going to last. Yeah? I bet it's a great day. I bet it's a great day. <laughs> a Texan day, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you didn't say if it was raining earlier today. You just said it was blue skies right now. So, you know, could be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, things can change fast in London, as we know. Indeed. Um, all right. Well, we have um, we have both Tyler and Def Beef's pieces pinned to the top of the space. If anyone wants to check them out, um, they were both curated into Feral File One Point Oh as part of the retrospective. Um, and I guess should we just get started? What do you all think? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Let's get started. Um, Hello and welcome to the Feral File Retrospective Conversation Series with artists and curators. My name is Elizabeth Sweet and I'm the communications lead at Feral File. Now, today we're here to talk about generative art with Deaf Beef and Tyler Hobbs. And thanks to Right Click Save and Alex Esterick for collaborating on this exciting talk with us. Now, before we get into it, I wanna give a bit of context for why we're here. So from June 28th to July 12th, Feral File is celebrating two years as a gallery in what we're calling the retrospective. And two exhibitions are taking center stage. We have The Experiment and Feral File 1.0. So The Experiment is a reflection on A2P, which stands for Artist to Peer. It was a project curated by Casey Reese, Rick Silva, Addy Wagonecht, and Exonimo, in which artists were asked to create an artwork and swap with each other over the course of a week. We didn't have the language at the time, but these were NFTs, and that was 2019. 
Now, the model and spirit of A2P served as the foundation of Feral File, which opened its first exhibition in May 2021 with Social Codes, created by Feral Fi- curated by Feral founder co Feral File co-founder, <laughs> tongue twister, Casey Reese. Since then, Feral File has hosted 33 exhibitions with curators and artists from across the digital art landscape. Each exhibition begins with a distinct curatorial vision that together help tell the story of digital art in the 21st century. So the experiment reflects on A2P and it spotlights spotlights 19 artists and artworks from the 2019 project. Feral File 1.0 is a celebration of all 33 artworks featuring one art, sorry, all 33 exhibitions featuring one artwork from each. This is curated by Casey Reese and Feral File 1.0 encompasses the breadth and depth of artists and artwork featured in the gallery. Both Tyler Hobbs and Def Beef are featured in this exhibition. I'll talk more about their pieces in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to mention a bit about the retrospective. So over the last few days, we've had talks with established artists featured in both exhibitions, who in the last two years have gone on to make even bigger waves in the digital art discourse and Web3 spaces. So our first talk, Environments, broached the collective spaces we share. We sat with Amelia Winger Bearskin, Jean Kogan, John Gerard, Jesse Damiani, and Alex Esterich and asked, what do we rely on? What can we protect? And what must we change in order to survive as a species? The second talk, Bodies, centered the individual unit of society as the whole. We sat with Anna Maria Caballero, Nancy Baker Cahill, Sean A. Mike Lane Holloway, Lee Blalick, Lauren Lee McCarthy, Oria Harvey, and Regina Harsani, and discussed perspectives on autonomy, ownership, vulnerability, and community, outlining notions of what a body might need. Now, for some super meta context, These topics were chosen because the relationship between the individual and the group or society is critical to the ethos of Bitmark, Feral File, and the autonomy wallet. So today's talk with Def Beef and Tyler Hobbs is about generative art. And it could go in many directions. Generative art is such a hot topic right now. And these are two of the most incredible artists in the space um, with such diverse practices. And we cannot wait to talk more about that today. And maybe we'll start with a bit of the overlap between raw materials and code and the building blocks of our world. But truly, generative art is a random practice. And we are so excited to see where this conversation takes us today. But before we jump in, I'd like to introduce my co-host. Please say hi to Alex Esterick, Editor-in-Chief of Right Click Save, an outstanding publication which serves as the important record of digital art, Web3, and the artists who inhabit these spaces. Now, Feral File is very pleased to partner up with Right Click Save in the coming months, so be sure to check out artist features in our next exhibitions. Thank you so much for collaborating on this discussion with me today, Alex. And before I hand it over to you, I'd like to turn it over to Def Beef and Tyler Hobbs. We're so, so, so grateful that you both have made time for us today. And Tyler, thank you for, uh, thank you for reinstalling Twitter. Um, hopefully you can just take it right off, right off after this, well, well, well. After this talk. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for um, having me, you know, I'm a massive fan of Duffy's work. Uh, I think Alex is one of the smartest people in this space um, and really knows what he's talking about. And of course, Feral File, I also have a lot of love for. So um, yeah, uh, lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. And let's start with you. So your your piece, Flight, appeared in Graph, curated, with, curated by Casey Reese. Now, Graph was the 10th exhibition on Feral File, and it opened in November 2021. Um, would you mind if, like saying a bit about it? And I'm sure everyone here knows about your practice, but if you want to say a bit about yourself and telling us about Flight, it'd be lovely. Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people here will already know. You know, I'm a, I'm a generative artist. I, I uh, since 2014, have um, primarily built my artistic practice around code. So for the typical project, I will, you know, construct an algorithm that uh, generates um, visual imagery. Usually it's static, 2D, usually it's abstract. Um, That's kind of been my uh, usual way of of, of working that most people are familiar with. But um, I've always um, uh, spent a lot of time drawing by hand as well. And Uh, Before I ever made generative artwork, I was really into figure drawing and, um, you know, drawing a lot of the natural world around me. And um, there's kind of been a a channel uh, of my work that uh, has focused on looking at ways to integrate the hand and the algorithm and different approaches to that. And so flight kind of um, came out of a particular approach that I, that I like to do of um, capturing, uh, capturing uh, drawings by hand as 
data as vector data that can easily be manipulated by the algorithm and uh, looking for ways to uh, really um, yeah, modify and extend and expand on what the hand is able to do. And so for flight, um, I started uh, doing a lot of drawings of uh, birds. Um, there's something to me really particularly special about birds in flight um, as a subject. And so I did a lot of preparatory uh, drawings, ended up selecting, I think it was um, five different kinds of birds. And then um, algorithmically manipulated those uh, to produce a final set of uh, 30 works, uh, all of which were then executed uh, as a, a pen plotter drawing on paper. So all of the works in the graph show were centered around the plotter, which uh, many people probably know. It's kind of a simple two axis robot that you can put a pen in it and give it instructions to, to draw something. A uh, great way to take a digital idea and translate it into the physical world. So that was the focus of the graph show. And so as, as part of that flight was also concerned with um, you know, the actual physical production of, of, of these works. And so a lot of the quality and character of that work is driven by the need to execute it physically on paper with a pen. That's a really big consideration. So I, I liked how that physical element kind of showed up both at the genesis and the final execution of the work. Um, kind of started with the hand, went through this digital algorithmic phase and ended up back on paper at the end of, uh, at the, end of the work. So um, yeah, that's basically what, what flight is. Thank you so much. Um, and for the audience, it's up in the, it's pinned up in the chat. So if you want to see, um, if you want to take a look, it's really, really beautiful. Um, next, I'd love to, I'd love to introduce Deaf Beef. How are you today? Um, I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Amazing. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I might've cut you off uh, with your introduction. Uh, but I just wanted to say that I'm, that I'm, I'm really pleased to be sharing a stage, uh, with you and Alex and Tyler. Tyler, I echo, I echo the sentiment. I'm a big fan of your work. And, uh, and Alex, I have great respect for everything that you're doing. Um, so, yeah, um, a bit about me. Uh, my name is also Tyler, but this is great because I can go by my pseudonym, Deaf Beef, so we can distinguish between the two Tylers. Um, my background, for the past 20-some years, I've been immersed in kind of a wide assortment of fields that overlap art and tech. Um, my path has wandered quite a bit. Uh, at times, I've studied music. Uh, electrical engineering. I ran a music recording studio. Uh, I've done some research in computer graphics. Um, and until recently, I supported myself as a blacksmith uh, running an artisan craft business, uh, making hand forged jewelry out of uh, alternative metals. Uh, so I like to explore and tinker, usually in a kind of a self-directed solitary way. Uh, currently, I'm best known in, in, uh, in this space as an audiovisual generative artist in the past uh, Several years, I adopted an art practice uh, intentionally using a uh, minimal tool set. Um, so on purpose, I chose a cheap laptop and just a C compiler uh, and then try to write from scratch without using any type of, type of external libraries and stuff, um, code that can produce sound and animation. Um, and so re most recently, that work kind of intersected with blockchain technology. And now I attempt to make code-based work that incorporates generative sound and music and also explores uh, some of the unique affordances of programmable blockchains. Um, so with all that, I don't have as much time as I'd like for, for blacksmithing, um, but, but uh, I look for ways to incorporate it into my art practice. And I, um, I really enjoy working with my hands and with real materials, um, making my own tools and machines, which has some overlap, I think, with generative code. Um, but with, with, uh, with, with this exhibition, On Screen Presence, the, the, the Feral File exhibition, it's been a wonderful opportunity to uh, bring together many of my interests and, and share them through um, a real-time performance. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll, for those that haven't seen the performance, I'll just describe basically this work. So it's Sketches and Iron is, um, is about the interconnection of, of many systems. And so in this performance, I'm in my shop, um, my, my blacksmithing shop. Uh, I strap a, a webcam to my head so they can have my, my hands free to do things. And uh, I live streamed a real time performance of me um, first uh, drawing blood from my finger uh, using a handmade iron tool that's been sharpened. Uh, and then I use, I'm type one diabetic. So I use my blood sugar reading. I test my blood sugar 
and then use that number as a random seed for a generative software system uh, that I run on the spot in real time to uh, make a design, a visual design. And then I fabricate uh, one element of that design um, there and then out of iron using a variety of, uh, of tools and systems, including a hammer and an anvil, um, a homemade 3,000 pound electrical mechanical power hammer, um, some other machines. And so it's, it's a mashup that loosely explores the interface between uh, many different systems and complicated feedback loops, um, biological, digital, mechanical, social, as well as the uh, contrast between, uh, I guess, tangibility and intangibility and maybe what we perceive as new and old technology. And the point of it is sort of to question the idea of any of these th things on their own being distinct categories or polar op opposites and rather um, seeing the whole thing as uh, like a continuum, um, considering there's, there's a writer, uh, a pioneering media artist and writer named Roy Ascot, who's written at length about, about the cybernetic theory of art making and sort of considering the art making process as a cybernetic system in which the artist is only one su subsystem uh, in a complicated feedback loop um, uh, with your environment. And uh, I wanted to show that and sort of expose the varying degrees of agency and autonomy that, uh, that all these components sort of have. So that's, that's sketches in iron. Deffy, thank you so much. Um, I think, you know, the combination of Tyler Hobbs and uh, Deathbeat's descriptions of their practices kind of reflects the, the sheer breadth um, of, and the implications of generative systems across aesthetic, political, social, um, and cross physical and digital, uh, machine and organic. And I think that, you know, when I think about flight or I think about the work like uh, degenerative, uh, which engages in a very participatory way with collectors. Um, I really think that even across these two artists, um, you know, the implications of generative systems are, are, are really uh, tangible. Um, and I, I want to, to, to perhaps um, move to Tyler Hobbs uh, to just ask you, you know, thinking of flight, staying with flight um, from your feral file show, where you see this kind of borderline between the machine, um, the generative system as a digital construct, but also the way it kind of bleeds into, um, no pun intended, um, the, the, the natural space. Um, because, you know, as, as Def, Def Beef's project for LACMA showed, um, you know, a, a work which played on um, this, the uh, movement studies of Edward Moybridge, uh, you know, flight in the same way seems to pick up the kind of um, early chrono photographs of, of Etienne Jules Marais. Um, so we, we, it seems like we're really talking not only about you know, human and machine, uh, but we're also talking about craft and the tradition of, of fine art and painting specifically. So Tyler Hobbs, I just want, wonder if you might speak to that kind of the full implications of generative systems across uh, physical, digital um, craft and fine yeah. art. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, I mean that's 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 a it's a huge question that you know I think we could talk really at length about, but I think maybe hopefully to get to the the core of that in my mind, um, you know, what constitutes a generative system is much broader than um, many people may think. You know, it doesn't even necessarily need to involve code. Um, it's really about I think the artist adopting a mindset and a practice that removes themselves from from complete control over the final outcome um the artist is really you know thinking about how to construct an interesting system with interesting possibilities and particularly i think possibilities that that might surprise even the artist in terms of their outcome um that's really the trade-off you know the artist loses control but they gain this ability for the system to to really surprise them and so code is you know one um excellent way of doing it doing that and it has uh, a lot of advantages you can you can really build a, an incredibly complex and, and specific type of system um but there are uh physical processes um and other approaches to to art making that um, really achieve those same artistic goals without the use of of code at all so um, I think 
you know, the, 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 the natural world provides uh, a wonderful source of, of, of chaos and, and, and randomness. And so even things like photography, in many ways, the photographer, depending on the subject that they're choosing to shoot, let's just say a bird in flight, right? Um, uh, they don't have complete control over, over exactly what's going to come out there. So I, I kind of view generative, the, the generative methodology as, as a type of spectrum and, and as a, a broad range of, um, you know, approaches to making work that's, that focus on that, that, that kind of system. Um, and, um, yeah, maybe, maybe I kind of, uh, lost the thread a little bit there on, uh, answering your question, but, uh, does that, does that kind of get to, uh, what you were asking about? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think my question had become so incoherent by the end. I think I was completely wrong. <laughs> um, but that, you know, the, the whole, the whole point was sort of for, for us to get out of the way a bit. I wonder death thief, if you want, you have any thoughts reflecting on what Tyler's just said. Yeah. I mean, like I resonate with the, uh, with a lot of that. Um, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, uh, generative uh, systems, like, I mean, like the, the definition of, of people have been arguing about the definition of, of generative art, especially, I mean, well, for a long time and, and, and recently people have thought a lot about it. I see it as it's a pretty broad term. Um, and if you take it for, for, for what it is, like, I mean, you could almost, you could almost make the argument that, uh, that all art making processes are in some sense are, are, are generative. Like, I mean, you know, if, uh, if you're an abstract painter, like what you ate for breakfast, uh, that could potentially influence, you know, how you're feeling when you start to put paint on the canvas. Um, so I think that, like, to say anything really specific about it, uh, or like, you have to be a little bit more specific about about uh, about, um, yeah, these definitions. But I I certainly agree that uh, that the it, it definitely doesn't have to use code or 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 a computer um, uh, to have uh, generative systems, and that there's lots of examples stretching back through history. Um, you know, uh, my, my particular interest is with music and, you know, there's been formalist music made from whatever Pythagorean ratios and the movement of planets. Um, and so, uh, and, you know, dice rolling and things in the 16th century. So you can, you can really look, you can, you can really find examples everywhere. Um, yeah. I mean, it seems to me, you know, you you um, the the what perhaps the one thing uh, I would imagine we don't want to lose in a discussion about generative art is the it uh, is is a level of coherence. I mean, in the sense that if gen if every art form is generative or is a form of generative art, um, how do we I suppose analyze good generative art from bad generative art or or apply any kind of um, qualitative judgments at all? Not to say that qualitative qualitative judgments are necessarily necessary. Uh, certainly, they're not necessary for a market. Um, but I think, you know, just already from the conversation so far, what's what's abundantly clear is just the sheer range of references that, you know, both uh, Tyler Hobbs and Death Beef are preoccupied with. Um, and I think, you know, from, from my perspective, just thinking of, of um, uh, perhaps more specifically about how generative art seems to have, have taken a, a turn over the last year or so. I, I come go back to, to Tyler Hobbs and Dandelion Wisp Project QQL. Um, and thinking also, Tyler, about, you know, your paintings uh, with Pace more recently um, about, you know, in a sense, this this perhaps this 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 move um, from, you know, generative artists embracing chance um, to generative artists, perhaps um, creating a set of parameters and making them available to a collector. And I think, you know, um, a question I've been wanting to ask for a while um, is, is whether there's a difference between, say, generative art and parametric art, which is which is to say mm. that a, an art form which allows collectors to play with parameters um, from an algorithm. Um, I just just wanted to know your yeah. thoughts on that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I have, I have quite a few uh, thoughts there. So first, first, I just want to say, like you, you mentioned, um, how do you, you know, a question about what's good generative art, right? Um, how do you sort of gauge whether a generative art project is, is, is effective? And of course, there can be uh, many, uh, you know, approaches and thoughts about that. But um, to, 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 to tie into the second part of your question, I think it has a lot to do with thinking about the space that the artist has constructed. So, um, you know, I often get the question, what is 
the the work of art you know with the with uh generative work is it these specific outputs is it the code is it you know uh the idea of the algorithm um you know what is what is the work and uh to me the most useful um as the artist what i like to think of as the work is really the potential space uh of the algorithm the potential set of outputs that can come from that algorithm uh, and of course, when you execute it, you're not able to fully capture that. But um, hopefully, you're presenting it in a way that that really does um, effectively display that space. And so, this is where curation becomes an important aspect of the project. This is about choosing how you display the space. So, some algorithms, um, let's say you take a really trivial. Uh, algorithm or one with a really specific vision where the randomness doesn't play a huge structural role. Maybe it only sort of randomness is only used for some of the finer details, right? Um, overall, the output of that algorithm is going to be very predictable. And so you can sort of take any output from it and it'll do a relatively good job of, of showing the space. Maybe you only need one, two images to kind of capture that space. Um, Perhaps you design uh, an algorithm, let's say uh, you're working on an art blocks project, right? And um, every single output uh, is gonna be uh, immortalized as part of the final collection. Um, as the artist, you, you, you have to think about a very different kind of uh, space to, to craft, right? You need to, the potential output space needs to be on the whole, you know, very strong. And, and I don't know, maybe you have certain concerns about if I'm going to capture, you know, 500 of these without curation, then I need to make sure that the type of variety that this algorithm expresses is interesting for 500 non-curated outputs. Uh, and then you take something like QQL or, or, or another project that can involve a curation step. That also allows you to, to craft a, a very different kind of space because now you don't need to worry so much about... Um, every single output. And in fact, you can ignore maybe 99% of the outputs or 99.99% of the outputs in the case of QQL, and really think about what are the far reaching corners of that space. Those are what are really gonna be highlighted. Um, so curation is a really important sort of axis for the design of a generative project because it has really big implications for how you as the artist shape that generative output space. And it would be, you know, uh, a major mistake to not take that into account when, when, when thinking about the space, about designing the space. So um, I don't think that there's, a, you know, none of these approaches are better than the other. They just have trade-offs in terms of what the artist can design and sort of what they need to optimize for when designing that generative process. That's fascinating. Thank you for speaking uh, in such depth and, and so eloquently. I, it's uh, very rare to get this opportunity. So I, I want to pass over to Def Beef. I think, you know, one thing, Def Beef, I, I wonder if you might comment on uh, based on what Tyler's just said is, you know, uh, using a word like, you know, output space or a phrase like output space or, and, um, you know, it makes me think, you know, not only perhaps about the, 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 the way a space uh, impacts a viewer, uh, in a visual sense, but also perhaps the the political and social implications of a space uh, um, which you might have created and engineered. Um, I, I don't know. How, how do you think about um, your creative potential um, to shape, uh, you know, the, these digital spaces in which we are now inhabiting? Yeah. Um, in preparing for this talk, I thought I tried to think about, you know, generative art and politics and the social political, you know, implications of, uh, of generative art. And again, like, uh, it comes down to sort of like, you know, uh, gener generative art is a, uh, time back to, to something that was already said, like you were asking about how we, how do we say what's a good generative art piece? I mean, we can have these kind of formalist ideas about what, what categorizes or, or like how we measure, uh, like a generative art piece, but, Gener generative art is a form, 
right? Like, uh, like when I think of, it doesn't, it's not necessarily the content. And so you can kind of distinguish between the form and the content. Sometimes they overlap, like generative art can be about itself. It can be about, um, you know, it could be about something overtly political and not overlap at all or, or whatever. And so I think that, uh, uh, I think that there's some, that, that that's something that kind of needs to be considered. Um, I think that uh, in, you know, the, the, in maybe in the 1960s, like by virtue of using code or computer to make art, then that had, that was radical. That had political implications. And some of the work like for like Chuck Siri has made overtly political work, random war. Um, and uh, I was reading that Max Benz, um, who uh, wrote the theory about rational generative aesthetics, um, uh, I was interested to learn that like his motivation for developing that rational theory was that like in post-war Germany, that uh, he was arguing that rationality was a primary defense against fascism, right? And so, and this was deeply influential to those pioneering generative artists. So there's, there's strong kind of, you can, you can clearly like see like these political and social implications of, uh, of, uh, of generative art or overtly political generative art at that time. Now, I don't, I don't know, but like, I feel like today, um, uh, I love formless work. And like, I mean, to be honest, like, uh, uh, my whole motivation for starting, uh, working with code to make, you know, abstract animation and sound was purely, purely that like for my own amusement. And, uh, I enjoy like, uh, like I, I enjoy abstract works. Um, but I feel like today, like purely by virtue of using code as, um, that it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily like bring along those same connotations maybe that, that it, that it used to. Um, it doesn't automatically make it meaningful simply by virtue of, of, of using code, I don't think. Uh, and yeah, I think it's something that we kind of have to struggle with, like as there's a push for generative art to be recognized and like, uh, larger canon or in the contemporary art world where it's been you know sort of ignored um like i think it's kind of a legitimate criticism that sometimes generative art can struggle to express um anything beyond its own formalism unless there's actually like a pure intention to make it overtly about something else and that's not a value judgment because i i, I like both of those things but it just might it might be an issue for certain discourses um and this is something i'm learning about i was not part of the you know, I don't, I don't have an art background. I was not part of the quote unquote art world any, any time before. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been thinking. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, the, what, one thing that it, you know, makes me think of, um, and I think, you know, perhaps comes back to that, that, um, you know, a, a project like QQL, for example, is the way it does to some extent liberate the collector or the, the receiver, the viewer, you know, the history of modernist painting in many ways is the history of, you know, artists producing objects to be looked at from it by a detached spectator. Uh, whereas uh, you perhaps, al although a lot of, it seems to me, a lot of generative art produced right now is very visually satisfying, vi visually seductive, you know, a, a work like QQL and, and any number of other works, um, you know, as we speak in the aftermath of, of the creation of FX Params, um, rely on co-creation. They, they actually depend on completion by their audience. So I don't know, you know, Deaf Beat, you know, I think about a work like Degenerative, which is participatory. And Tyler, obviously, thinking about QQL here. Um, is co-creation now kind of essential to the meaning, perhaps? Um, or is it a choice from the artist? Um, does the artist depend, um, does the generative artist depend on the, um, the, the, the kind of co-creation of their collectors in a way that perhaps modernist painters didn't? That's for Tyler Hodge. <laughs> Yeah, um, lovely question. I think what that kind of touches on is a broader trend of, of the implications of generative art. Um, I, I really feel that sort of the more generative uh, a, a work is, that the more curation plays an important role. And of course, that's not, it's not, you know, 100% across the board, but generally speaking, um, when we start to look at these uh, systems, algorithmic works, AI art, where it's relatively inexpensive to 
look at, you know, a huge swath of, of an output space, that's where sort of the discerning eye and, 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 and um, curation and thoughtful selection um, becomes really, really important. And so to me, I feel, um, yeah, kind of the power is shifting a little bit from the creator to the curator. And you can, as the artist, choose to make yourself not the curator, right? You can, you can appoint some other artist. You can appoint uh, the community. You can appoint your collectors. You can appoint an AI to, to curate the output. Um, you, you have a lot of, um, of, of power in that way. And um, so I, I think, yeah, I think that, that that aspect of the work is more and more important for a lot of um, generative uh, works these days, although it, it doesn't have to be, obviously, it doesn't have to be, you know, for example, Fidenza had no curation and uh, I think was a successful project. So uh, by no means is it necessary, but it's more frequently, it's uh, an important component of the work. Completely. Um, Definitely. Does, does, uh, does that resonate with you? It does. Um, also, something I wanted to add to that was that like something that makes like QQL unique and and basically, like what makes like uh, this new uh, like generative art part of the reason why we've seen this kind of explosion is because, um, like the like using the blockchain for as a means for you know to as a proxy for these types of social interactions, like as a collective experience, and um, uh, you know, like it used to be, uh, people made it was sort of a bit more ephemeral, right? If you share things on the internet or on social media, it's there, and then it's and then it's there and then it's gone right and having the blockchain as a common reference point as a focal point and like uh uh to have these things play out like on you know in discord or social media but then having the blockchain sort of uh like used as sort of a i don't know like a game board or some some point of reference um is uh, as a focal point something new um that experience i think is something new and has really been important um uh for uh for generative art and you know, when you start adding these different token mechanisms and different programmable, uh, you know, elements to the to the work that like to me, that's really getting into interesting territory. And uh, QQL is a great example of that. So I have a question kind of on this thread. Um, now, thinking about generative programs and how, you know, outputs are like 500 to in the thousands of, 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 of outputs and pieces. And then thinking about the tokenomics and the and sort of the market incentives, would you would you think that it would be worth it, or is there an argument for creating a generative program that then only produces one artwork? Do you think that there's something to that, or is that does that kind of go against what um, what 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 the program itself was made for? Question for both. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to hear um, Deputy's thoughts on this, but. To me, that, that's kind of um, that question kind of drives at to me a bit of the difference between, say, algorithmic work and generative work. Like these are two. If you if you look at the Venn diagram of these two, it's kind of a messy picture, and neither one has a perfectly clear definition. But um, you could, you know. Uh, you can write an algorithm that generates exactly one image every single time that it's run. And um, uh, many generative artists, algorithmic artists, I should say, many algorithmic artists uh, have done this over the years. I did this myself, especially when I was getting started. This was very much an easier target um, uh, for me to, to, to work towards. Um, it's, to me, there's, there's a really interesting shift, though, away from that whenever you start to design the algorithm with multiple outputs in mind, because that really um, shifts your focus as the artist from thinking about one single visual output versus that entire system of possibilities, that, that output space. And to me, like originally being a traditional artist before this, shifting to that mindset was the biggest uh, change uh, in, in, in switching to generative art is bigger than going from figurative to abstract. It was bigger than working with my hands to working with code. Um, thinking in terms of an entire output space, potential output space 
was like the, 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 the biggest fundamental shift. And the one that seemed honestly the most um, compelling out of all the reasons to make generative work. Um, so uh, yeah, you can write an algorithm that makes one particular output. You can do that to make something uh, that looks amazing. There can be, there can be a lot of value and a lot of reason for, for wanting to do that. But it, to me, it does personally kind of lose that mystique of like the whole generative output space. Um, and so I don't often choose to work that way. It's just not part of my working practice very often, but I would never, you know, fault an artist for, for working that way. It's just kind of a different mindset and goal for, for the work when you, when you work that way. Yeah. I, I don't know if I, I interpreted the question to mean that like, if you would publish the code and then only have one output available. And so if I think about it that way, I mean, I guess in a way that kind of defeats the purpose, perhaps, unless it was the artist's intention. I mean, there's something poetic maybe about, you know, building a machine and then only allow it to do some one menial task or build a machine that destroys itself. So, you know, maybe as a conceptual work, that would be, uh, that could be interesting. Um, but again, like if the code is published, uh, you know, other people can run it. Like people can, people can go and generate other, synth poems or whatever they want a lot not a lot of people do but you're you're capable of doing that it's just that they're not tokenized they can't be they can't be traded so they don't have the same meaning um so yeah maybe maybe it's okay um and it all i think it, there, there's also the question of like whether like what what like what's what's the artwork is it the output or is it the code and there's some people that believe that prizing the individual outputs of a generative algorithm, um, like might even amount to like a fetish, right? Like, why isn't it, why isn't it the code that is the, is the ultimate edition or something? So, um, yeah, you, you, you could, it's an interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to, um, I mean, one of the things, um, you know, partly one of the reasons I think this is a really special um, conversation um, is, uh, you know, from a perspective of, of right click save it is, you know, we've made and tried to make a concerted effort to situate, you know, this current um, kind of golden generation of, of generative artists in a historical lineage. And that means, you know, maybe going back to the 1960s, computer artists might uh, demand that we talk to someone like Roman Voroshko from the 80s. Um, or 70s uh, and more recently um, it might mean we talk to uh, Casey Reese um, who co-created uh, Processing with Ben Fry um, but I, I have to say you know exciting thing I've been sitting on a text for a while um, very special interview with uh, Michael Knoll um, who's one of the very earliest generative artists who, who worked for Bell Labs in the 1960s and uh, he, he published a memorandum on his, his work in 1962, uh, which is sometimes uh, given as a justification for making him the, the, the earliest recorded generative artist or um, computer artist. Um, he actually isn't very interested in, in that, but I think, um, you know, who's first has become a kind of preoccupation. Um, and I think, you know, one of the striking things that he says, and I'm just going to quote him here, this is, a, this is from a, a conversation that we're, we're due to publish on Monday, um, is... You know, in August 1962, I wrote a technical me memorandum documenting what I'd been doing um, that was distributed to, to 40 or 50 people at Bell Labs. Computer music was already going on there. Uh, and now there was digital computer art as well. Um, and I, I just I just wanted to, 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 to perhaps um, pitch it to Death Beef. Um, this this again, coming back to this idea of the kind of um, the, the just the range of potential of generative systems. Um, you know, I'm thinking about you know, a collaboration between someone like Aaron Penne and, and Beretta, um, which I think is in a really meaningful one. Um, recently, um, I'm thinking about, you know, generative choreography by, by operator. Uh, I just wonder, you know, Def Beef, if you might comment perhaps on, on you know, um, are you conscious of, of your place in a, in a historical lineage? Um, is that useful as an activity? Um, and um, what do you think about the implications of generative systems beyond the visual? Um, sure. Uh, do I think of myself? Uh, it's not something that I've like particularly concerned myself, especially before um, like all this happened. 
um, like my background is not formally in art, right? It's in electrical engineering, sound technology, music, um, uh, computer animation. So a lot of my influences stem from that. And a lot of the choices that I made about activities that I do, um, it's what without, it wasn't without, it was with no consideration that, you know, if you're a practicing artist, there are considerations, right? If you're trying to say something within a particular discourse, that's going to influence what you're going to do. But me, it's just me tinkering in my, in my basement and garage. Um, so it's really been since all this happened, um, you know, it's been uh, that now I'm starting to try to, you know, maybe look back and try to contextualize things a little bit more and trace um, like how my experiences connect to uh, to to some other things. And um, so, like, uh, you know, like w when I was studying computer animation in grad school, uh, like I learned a lot about the history of technology and you know, there's there's people that that uh, from the commercial animation industry that really that really overlaps with uh, it, like I mean maybe it, like um, like so John Whitney who like pioneered a lot of uh, um, you know visual uh, um, you could say I I would say like generative work and uh, and then later with computers and Lillian Schwartz Larry Cuba Larry Cuba like, you know, worked on Star Wars, right? Like it overlaps with like uh, the commercial film industry. And so there is, there, and, and the people that I knew, the colleagues that I know, um, like they've, some of them have won like Academy Awards for, you know, for algorithms and stuff that they've made that have uh, made special effects or, or, or uh, types of animation or character animation or lighting or whatever. And so there is like these overlaps there, but that's not really relevant, I don't think within, well, at least uh, not to date, that's not really that's not really a thread that's ever talked about in, in a fine art discourse, but that's, that's legit. That's, that's my, that, that's my lineage sort of. Um, the, the other thing is games. So uh, my earliest introduction to uh, uh, procedural system was um, playing this uh, genre of games called roguelikes when I, when I was a kid. Uh, so these are like dungeon crawler games. And every time that you play the graphic, the graphics were really simple. It's like ASCII terminal type of stuff. You have characters that represent, a 2D map, but every time that you play, the level was different. The the there was there there was different structure to it. There was randomization of of a whole bunch of things, and it and it all worked. And that was completely fascinating to me. And um, that's what really influenced my desire to explore computing for those types of creative purposes. And I spent my childhood um, uh, learning how to do that, in basically in an effort to like write games or you know things that move and like kind of mechanisms and things that do stuff. So. Again, that's that's another thread that's not um, it's not it's not right in there with like what you'd see f within uh, contemporary art discourse or even like the lineage of of uh, uh, of generative art. But I think that that's I think that's fairly important. Um, so those are my honest kind of uh, um, influences. And then later, like, you know, I was interested in music and electronic music and synthesizers and stuff. And uh, I like I like uh, I like animation. Um, and so uh, early film and visual music. Um, Oscar Fischinger, Norman McLaren, um, you know, all, all of the synthesis, there's so, there's so many of them. And uh, there, there's so many pioneering uh, people that did stuff with sound and music that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's generative. And it happened to be before the, the stuff that you did visually simply because the, it, was, uh, it was easier to work with a one-dimensional signal than it is to work with, say, a raster display or, or a plotter or something. Um, so, um, yeah, there's there's uh, there's there's a there's a bunch of stuff, and I'm still trying to connect the dots on all of it. I will say that um, I don't think that it's really a lineage. I really see it as like a, a wide constellation network of varying influences that overlap all sorts of things. And uh, even with what I see, with um, you know, w without knowing much about art history and those different discourses, I can see that there are pieces missing um, from my experience um, with you know more the more commercial. Um, animation side of it it's like well there's some important stuff there too so maybe i don't know yeah i'm still figuring it out thanks no it's fascinating and i i think you know from my perspective and there is a sort of ideological component here but um you know for me the thing that the nfc did was it it opened up i think a market for not just digital art but art uh, being created by um artists who were previously not recognized as artists or fine artists at least and i think the thing that deaf beef you know you, you hint at is is the sense of like there are a load of practices um and discourses which perhaps have not been historically um covered 
uh, within, you know, the, the fine art canon. You know, just as one point, I do find it fascinating that you're a metal worker. Uh, Albrecht Dürer was a metal worker who tried to make his, his career as a painter and didn't do very well, uh, but, you know, did pretty well as a, as a, as a, as a printmaker and, and sort of all round polymath. So it seems like this, this notion of, uh, you know, kind of versatile, maybe generative creators um, trying to fit themselves into pre-existing lineages is, is a problem for the ages. And I think Tyler Hobbs, you know, just just coming to you finally, uh, you know, you know, you've had a lot of success recently. Uh, you know, can't deny it in 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 a generative art collecting community, that kind of Web3 community, but also in in a, in, in the context of um you know, traditional painting, dare I say. I just wonder, Tyler Hobbs, whether you feel that um, you, you find yourself sort of uh, in a process of sort of trying to narrate your work because you write about your work. And I wonder whether, you know, a fine art audience receives your work differently to, say, a, a Web3 audience. Uh, yeah, great question. I see Deaf People has his hand raised. Do you want to you say anything? Okay. Oh, sorry. I tried to turn that off. I, I, I was just going to interject. I want to take up too much time, but you mentioned the metal work. And I just want to say briefly that my original inspiration to start working metal was because of kinetic sculpture. I saw the uh, videos on YouTube of Arthur Ganson when YouTube first started. And he makes these brilliant, like uh, whimsical, wiry machines that have evoked str poetic, evoke strong emotions. And so kinetic art is really, uh, in my mind, also uh, connected with uh, generative art. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, that's a that, that's also a great uh, point. Um, yeah, Casey actually showed me a kinetic sculpture at um, UCLA. That's you know, in some ways, it's like every second you're seeing a new sculpture. It's a type of generative system, uh, which I think just connects to you know how uh, how broad this uh, you know sort of mentality about generative art can be. Um, Alex, to get back to your question. Um, Let's see if I can say that back to you. Um, how do I how do I think like traditional art collectors kind of see this work? Uh, you know, are they able to understand? Are they able to understand? You know, the motivation and um, artistic interest in it. Uh, is that is that a fair way to say to summarize your question? Yeah, I suppose it's just there's, there's a difference between you know you produce one practice which is received by multiple different audiences and i, I wonder how that yeah, yeah how that affects you yeah i think it's um i'll say it doesn't it doesn't affect like the work that i make so much of course anytime i'm making a work i'm i'm unlikely to be thinking about where it will be seen in the context that it will be seen and i think that's just kind of something smart to do as, uh, as an artist. And so you can't really help but, but do that. And so of course, if I'm, I don't know, say making work for a pace gallery, I'm going to be making a different kind of work than uh, if it's going to go on art blocks. Um, but uh, fundamentally it, 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 you know, it has to be interesting uh, to me and, and, and interesting for my own reasons. Um, and so I don't, I don't find myself kind of going into it, uh, you know, trying to make a different type of work or, or, or thinking differently about the work, but there is something really important about the storytelling, right? So um, as the artist, you usually have some opportunity to, to, to talk about the work, right? Anything from how you title it, how you title the show, how you title the works, you know, sort of your artist statement, the show statement, um, doing things like, you know, Twitter spaces and other sort of promotion, um, and you, I, th I think you have to be cognizant that, um, people in different spheres, they speak different languages and they, and they have different reference points. So, um, I might, for example, uh, with a traditional art space, be able to, to, to really lean into talking about, um, elements of the generative methodology that I see in uh, Richard Diebenkorn's work, who is a, a traditional abstract painter, very well known in the traditional art world. But if I say Richard Diebenkorn on a Twitter space, there's maybe a small percentage of people who are going to recognize that, right? So I think um, people want to understand the work that they're looking at. And part of how you talk about the work helps them to, 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 draw from these reference points to help kind of understand the workers to, to, to start to approach it, to start to get their arms a little bit around it. Um, that's part of the value of, of talking about your work as an artist, 
Um, and so, uh, luckily I, I, I feel I'm decent at, at being able to talk to both audiences. You know, I, I, um, come from a programming background. I'm able to kind of talk about work from a more technical perspective or in a language that I know, uh, people with like an engineering background will really resonate with. But of course, I've also spent a lot of time, uh, studying fine art, reading about it, spending time in that world. And so, um, I think being able to, to speak the language in, in, of the space that you're showing the work in is, is really, really valuable. So overall, it's the kind of work I make doesn't change, but how maybe how I talk about the work does change. Does that make sense? That's lovely. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, – Deppie, if you have a – any kind of a similar experience? Um, well, I mean, I'm pretty much uh, I'm pretty much in in, in Web three uh, right now. So, I mean, I mean, I I, I mean, with different audiences, yeah. Sometimes I like uh, I guess um, I struggle a bit to be able to change the way I describe things to different people. I'm I already have like you know difficulty explaining it enough that it's hard to put that kind of translator on. And uh, I think that maybe sometimes it's hard to get all the details across, <laughs> but I can, uh, I can, I can definitely identify with what you're saying. I was just going to say, uh, just while we've got you both, um, such a privilege once again, um, wh whether you had a question for each other. Ooh, uh, yeah, good question. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious about uh, working with Seed directly, and um, like that's uh, always been a really fascinating aspect of uh, your work, Def Beef, uh, that you chose to work with just a C compiler, which is you know a very basic tool. It's kind of like you know an artist choosing to work with nothing but. Uh, uh, you know, a single pencil and, and paper or something like that. Um, how do you, um, I, you know, I think constraints can really breed uh, creativity. I'm wondering if you, if you have any thoughts about how that's like influenced your particular aesthetic. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's a thoughtful question. Um, so like, I mean, really what I did when, when this, when this came about, when I started, you know, choosing to work this way like i already had like a big familiarity like working with c like uh and working in a in a terminal without using a mouse and just using command line tools and nothing else like i enjoyed it like it was like being it was like it's like playing nethack it's like playing a roguelike game right there's like you're you're in there and that kind of you know that comes through in the pseudonym that i chose for myself def beef is an example of hack speak and so i think it does I think it does like sort of influence the ethos of it. Like it was an, it, it's sort of an intentional nerdy choice to put that across. And I was curious, I guess, like how it, um, I didn't know what was going to come out. Right. Like I know that if I use a certain, you know, if, if I use Ableton live or if I use whatever, like some soft synth or this or that there, there, there's a prescribed workflow sometimes, or if you use like a timeline that has a grid, there's 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 a there's a prescribed workflow for um, you know design tools that will lead you down that path, and you kind of have to if you're going to do something different, you kind of have to work against it. But without any of that structure, I didn't know like what would exactly would come out. Like how am I going to think about you know sequencing time? How am I going to think about um, like pitch and stuff? And um, so it was kind of like oh, it's like when you begin starting a sentence, you don't know how you're going to finish it. Um, I was just really curious, like a curiosity is sort of the driving force. Like it's, it's exploration. That's what kind of makes it motivating and fun. Um, so um, that, that's, that's really kind of the, the impetus for it. I don't, I don't know that like what, like working that way will necessarily produce any better results. I don't think that it would, but it would produce something more unique to the way that you work. And then whatever that is, then that will be more meaningful to you, especially if you're just making it for yourself the way that I was originally thinking about it. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for that. Uh -huh. um, now yeah. let me think. Let me think about a question. I mean, if we have time, um, uh, yeah, I guess maybe maybe along similar lines. Like, how how do you think about your your tool choices? 
and and about how they influence um like what happens and like what do you think about um uh because i think that you've probably written about some of those things as well about how tools will influence the outcome and if yeah. there's if there's any kind of you know insight that you have about that yeah absolutely i think i think they 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 really really do and um uh, maybe this is almost like kind of what made me interested in, in asking you that question is I do, I do feel that um, computers and, and what sort of comes naturally to them, what's easy on a computer versus hard on a computer has a, a massive effect on, on the aesthetics of digital artwork because everything kind of has to go through that, that filter. So there's just really a bias towards, as you know, things like uh, grids and rectangles and, straight lines and clean fills and, and, and all that. And, um, and I think even uh, programming language design um, uh, has a big influence on that. Like, like for example, um, the processing API, I'm, I'm, sh I'm certain that the API that uh, Casey and Ben came up with has had this like tremendous cascading effect on thousands of pieces of artwork uh, since, because some things are just really natural to do in processing and other things are, uh, like much more computationally expensive or just take a lot more code. And so they're just less likely to be done. Um, so I'm, I'm really fascinated by, you know, all aspects of um, how tooling really uh, influences um, the work that, that that's made with it and sort of trying to dig into that visually, aesthetically. Um, I'm probably a little bit too close to my own, my own tool choice to like, necessarily be able to say, but, um, um, you know, I, I chose a programming language that's, it's kind of esoteric. Um, it's a little bit, um, strange, but it's, uh, it's really, really powerful if you're just sort of a solo, uh, coder, it's a programming language called closure, which is a, a Lisp dialect for anybody that that, um, makes sense to, um, so it's something that kind of gives you a lot of flexibility and, and, and power to, to, to do complicated things uh, very succinctly. Um, but it's not great for like collaboration uh, because it's so customizable. You can kind of do your own weird idiosyncratic things. Um, and um, yeah, I think that just to kind of follow this like train of thought, you know, a big part of my tooling at this point is all the little chunks of algorithms that I've already built. So for example, uh, let's say flow fields, like I have tons and tons of code sitting around uh, that, that, that does all kinds of interesting things with flow fields. And I can just kind of copy paste that in and, and get to work really quickly. So I don't have to labor for, you know, one or two days uh, just trying to code up, um, you know, a particular component um, and so, and so, of course, I'm, you know, given that I'm much more likely to like reach in my bag and grab, say, flow field code to, to kind of accomplish generating some curves. Um, so I think it's yeah, it's not even necessarily just the the programming language and and those sort of aspects, but all the code that you've written before just kind of has this feedback loop effect of um, really shaping what you do next. And I, you know, that's been true for. For artists throughout time, uh, painters tend to develop a visual language that they rely on. They don't reinvent the wheel every time they start a new painting. You know, they tend to use similar colors and textures and compositional strategies. Um, I just think that uh, with alg algorithmic artwork, it, it um, gets even more amplified because it is so much easier to to really reuse and extend the ideas that you've built before. In, uh, that's fascinating. In 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 uh, in blacksmithing, uh, like someone told me that if you want to if you want to know the quality of, of someone's work, you look at their tools, right? So if you see that because blacksmiths make their own tools, and this is an overlap sort of with you know custom low level generative programming, um, and so so yeah, it's the same thing. You build up your arsenal of tools, and that's what allows you to have your own style and work efficiently. Um, um, as a as a as a blacksmith or as a generative artist, which is a which is a kind of a neat connection. That's super cool. I was also just going to say, you know, it's fascinating um, hearing both of you. But Tyler, you know, to find out that you're 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 using a code that um, originating with Lisp, which is uh, you know one of the earliest um, programming languages, 
um, which is the language that Harold Cohen used, actually, when he made his career switch from being a, a modernist painter uh, to programming uh, his, his longstanding program, Aeron. Um, it just uh, it just kind of brings things full circle to hear you talking about, you know, uh, the art of painting with with a, a kind of um, a, a code derived from Lisp. So, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, it's lovely to hear you, you guys speaking back and forth. And I'm going to shut up now and pass back to Elizabeth. Wow, thank you all so much. Truly, this conversation has been incredible and a real gift to be part of. Um, I think if if there are no more questions or uh, or or if you want to say something just to close, then that would be great. Um, but we can we can go ahead and 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 finish up uh, if that's all right with you all. Great. Okay, fantastic. Well, really, thank you again so much. This conversation has been a privilege, as Alex said. Um, it's been an honor to discuss Turn of Art with you both today and in this retrospective. Um, and so I'll just say a bit about what's, what, what we have coming up um, in the next few days. So on Monday, July 10th, we have a talk on Zoom about digital art and NFT art, uh, sorry, digital art versus NFT art with Oria Harvey, uh, Cole Root from the Lee Mulliken Estate, Dimitri Cherniak, Lauren Lee McCarthy, Raphael Rosendahl, Peter Burr. And that is uh, moderated by Tina Rivers Ryan. And the link for that, um, is an Eventbrite link, so be sure to find it on um, on our socials. And then on Tuesday, uh, July 11th, we have a conversation with curators at 6 p.m. Eastern, and that's with Casey Reese, Christian Paul, Regina Harsani, Alex Esterich, uh, Annika Meyer, and Rick Silva. And that's going to be another great one as well. And then on Wednesday, we have our closing conversation with Casey Reese, Charlotte Kent, and Chris Coleman, along with several of the artists featured in the retrospective. And this will be at 1 p.m. Eastern on July 12th. We haven't sent out the link for that yet, but please do mark your calendar. Um, and then speaking of what's coming next, um, and Aaron Penny has been mentioned quite a few times as well uh, in this conversation. On July 13th, we are extremely excited to begin the next chapter of Feral File with N equals 12, an exhibition curated by Aaron Penny and featuring Ana Lucia, Nadia Bremer, Daniel Katt, Riva Fan, Peter Pazma, El Sif, Leah Coleman, Bart Simmons, Raylan Ark, Nicole Vela, Ipsketch, and Melissa Wooderek. And we are so excited to open with that on July 13th with a brand new website in this next phase of Feral File. So with that, I just wanna say thank you again so much. Um, thank you, Tyler and Tyler and Alex um, for being here today and for sharing, for sharing your insights and perspective really um this is a this is a historic conversation so really appreciate you all and thank you everyone for tuning in and this will be recorded so you can listen back again and again thank you all thanks so much thanks, everyone thanks so much all right everyone have a great weekend take care mm -hmm.